Factions are simply groups of monsters within a dungeon. Here's a quick and simple method to flesh them out and give your players a little something to work with. I call it the four blanks method because we're going to fill in four blanks. As you can see here in the brackets, faction wants motivation, but obstacle. Therefore, method of surmounting obstacle. For example, goblins want the amulet of Yendor, but the minotaur guards it. Therefore, the goblins have set up traps within the Minotaur's Labyrinth. The first thing we come up with is the faction. This is usually going to be a monster, and in fact we can use the random monster tables that we see in our rule sets and our modules. The second thing is a motivation, something that they want, a goal or desire. In this case it's treasure, the Amulet of Yendor. There also needs to be something that's preventing them from achieving their goal. We call this the obstacle. In this case, it's another monster, the Minotaur of the dungeon. And then we need to come up with a way for the faction to get around that obstacle, or to attempt to get around that obstacle. And in this case, the goblins are trying to kill the Minotaur, and they're trying to kill the Minotaur by setting traps for it. Why I prefer this method specifically is that it gives you a lot of information about the faction while using very, very, very little effort. And it's important to have low effort go into this because it's not guaranteed that your players are going to come across this faction. And if they do come across it, it's not guaranteed that they're going to interact with it and not just kill them or ignore them or move on. So we don't want to spend hours and hours fleshing out a faction that our players are not going to interact with. Now, even though we've put in a, a small amount of effort into this, it still gives us big, broad strokes that we can develop if players choose to interact with it and, and engage with the faction a little bit more. It gives us a really good roadmap. It gives us an idea of what factions are going to be doing when the players encounter them in the dungeon. So they don't just come across a pack of orcs, they come across a pack of orcs who are doing something. And when they come across these orcs, they're going to know or sorry, you are going to know how those orcs are going to react to the players based on the reaction role. So we're not just staring at each other awkwardly waiting for the other to make a move. And it also lets the players know what they can do to interact with this faction. Do they want to uh, help this faction or do they want to fight against this faction? And how can they do that? And the thing that I love about this method is that it's really, really, really easy to set up random tables to help with this. We can generate factions, motivations, and obstacles using a very simple table. Um, the uh, methods of surmounting obstacles, I typically recommend writing your own uh, because it's going to depend on the obstacles and the factions, etc., etc. So I'll have a, a table for the first three, usually, and then I'll just come up with the methods on the fly. It's faction, motivation, obstacle, method. Those are the four blanks that we're filling in. To talk a little bit more about factions, these can be within the dungeon, things like monsters, beasts, and my personal favorite, rival adventuring parties. I love having a rival adventuring party. Uh, but these can also be out of the dungeon. These can be in towns, these can be on your hex maps. Um, they can be things like guilds, and the guilds can be mundane, or they can be magical. They can be social classes, something like a noble or a criminal or a, 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 a member of the clergy. The motivations are chiefly going to be treasure. I really love using treasure as a motivation, and in fact, if there was no other motivation that I would use, uh, it would be treasure. It's, it's great because it also gets the players interested in the motivation as well. Uh, it can also be things like base needs, food and water, uh, things like power. They want to expand the area of the dungeon that they control, and this can turn into a nice little turf war that your players can take part in. Revenge is a, is a classic. but uh, until you're comfortable using this method, I'd, I'd really recommend sticking with the, the more simple methods, like we want to find this sword, we want to find this uh, chalice, we want to find this gem, whatever it is. And the motivation might be something that's both treasure and a means of acquiring power or something like that, and that's totally fine. Um, when different factions share the same motivation, this creates a wonderful opportunity for alliance or maybe rivalry that your players can really, really get into. Talking a little bit more about obstacles, uh, chiefly, and, and I think the, most, the easiest obstacle to use would be monsters and uh, other factions as well. This really helps the whole dungeon sort of mesh together and 
be interconnected. But it can also be something like an external force, like a depletion of resources. They're starving or, or they're uh, out of money or something like that. And there can also be obstacles within a faction, usually through things like uh, treachery, spies, backstabbing. What we're seeking to do when we come up with the obstacle is to answer the question, why hasn't the faction achieved their goal yet? You know, what is stopping the pygmy psionicists from acquiring the golden statue of Mani? Uh, the, the factions can share goals, but they can also share obstacles. And sharing obstacles usually means that the, the ground is fertile for an alliance, and players can sow their machinations among this. Uh, methods. We want to know how the faction, not necessarily the players, but the faction, deal with the obstacle. So maybe the golden statue of Mani is cursed. Well, the Sionists are delving the infinite library to find ways to break the curse. They don't know where it is. They're traveling around asking after it. It's sealed in Realm of Zot. Well, they're contacting Lords of Pandemonium to own the gate. You can see that the different types of uh, methods that they can use are going to be dependent on the different types of obstacles. And methods might succeed or fail without the player interfering with them. So strictly keeping time records and tracking uh, what happens and when it happens is very important to making your dungeon feel alive. Uh, so for example, if they're searching the infinite library, that just might be an encounter in the library. If we're treating the library as a dungeon, every once in a while players might encounter these psionicists and they're searching uh, for ways to break the curse. Uh, but also it might be something that has a time limit on it. If they are traveling the hex map, and when players encounter them on the hex, back, hex map, they're asking about the statue, uh, we might, after three months, find out that these Sionists have found out where the statue is, so we don't encounter them anymore because now they're you know, traveling to wherever the statue is. It could also be on a really small timeline. Uh, they, we encounter the Sionists in the dungeon who are preparing to attack the, uh, the slimes who are guarding the statue, and after a week they've launched their assault, and then we as the DM or as the referee can decide whether or not they succeeded or, or used dice to figure it out. Obstacle and method are, are really, really important to this, uh, and I like it better than just having a faction and a need. Um, it, it doesn't do as much. The orcs want treasure. Well, okay, but let's give them an obstacle. Let's give them something that they that is standing between them and the treasure. It can be something simple, like the treasure chest being locked, but then the orcs are not just going to sit there and throw their hands in the air and say, well, we can't get the treasure now. They're going to try something. And the, the wonderful thing about trying something is that it, it immediately tells you what they're going to be doing when the players encounter them. They're hitting the padlock with a hatchet. And the obstacle and the method together can inform the referee how the faction is going to react to the players coming across them. Is it a hostile reaction? You know, the, the, the dice roll reaction. If they uh, come out hostile, they might fling their hatchet at the PCs and attack to guard the treasure. But if it's a neutral reaction, they might ask them for help, um, you know, in a, in a sort of menacing way. And if it's friendly, they might offer a reward for their help. The key about the obstacle and method as well is that it can give us a timeline and make the dungeon really feel alive. Um, if the PCs come back a week later, they might find a smashed open chest uh, filled with priceless scrolls that the orcs have sort of left behind because they can't even read. Um, but this can, can really make the dungeon feel like a living, changing entity rather than a, a, a preset stage sort of video gamey abstract, something that's, that's not really... F that doesn't really feel like a real world. By, by keeping events fluid, um, we can really make things feel more real. However, I might recommend for a first-time referee to keep things a little more in stasis rather than overwhelm yourself with trying to keep track of all these different things. Why make factions in the first place? We can solve problems without combat. Um, we can help the players out by giving them friendly factions. Um, they can invest their time and resources into growing the factions, and importantly, we're going to encounter a lot of, for example, bands of goblins in the course of a campaign, or if you don't use goblins in your milieu, something akin to goblins, you know, low-level monsters that we've seen a hundred times. Well, this time, if it's the hundredth time we've seen it, it's going to be distinct from the 99th, because the faction's goals, obstacles, and methods are going to be distinct and that will help keep things fresh and new for your players. Now, once 
players have invested a little bit of time and effort in a faction and you know that they're not just going to abandon them or kill them when they come across them and it can be worth your while to put a little bit more time and effort into making the factions come alive a little bit more. Uh, a good place to start, I think, are a few sentences that might have to do with their lair, their leader, maybe some treasures that they have, and some interesting faction twists. Uh, twists can be things like, in this example, we have the Sun Cult, their lair is a burned out cathedral, their leader is a banished prince, a treasure is a flaming sword, and one of the twists is just an oddity about the faction, something that sticks out, something that you notice, something like how they're covered with tattoos of briars, just something to make them stand out a little bit more. I would really encourage you to try out this method. Uh, sit down with your dungeon and pick a couple factions that you have, uh, a couple groups of monsters that you have. Check out your wandering monster table and try to come up with something that they want, something that they're after, and then something that's preventing them from getting that thing that they want, and then come up with how they're going to surmount that. And uh, please let me know what you come up with. I really like to hear all these things um, that people use my methods for, and, and some people have found really good success with this. So please let me know, and thank you very much.